So we're going to start out by talking about uh, physician leadership. And uh, I'd, I'd like to invite uh, Steve Bachan, who's one of our fellows here at Duke, uh, to kind of lead us off uh, on uh, what his thoughts are about leadership. And then I'm going to talk specifically about uh, some things that we're doing here at Duke. And then I'll hand it back to Steve and he can share some of his lessons learned. So Steve, go ahead. Yeah, thanks, Dr. Taylor. So I'm honored to talk tonight. Um, initially, um, when asked to chat about maybe some helpful information that, in early practice, uh, realizing that I had not yet begun my early practice, I wanted to really try and talk about something that I think um, I gained a great deal of experience in this year and part of the Fagan Leadership Program and something that I think would have uh, help any surgeon in their initial uh, few years of practice. So if we go to the next slide. So here's the outline. Um, specifically, I want to ch chat a little bit about the Duke uh, John uh, Fagan Leadership Program. Um, talk a little bit about physician leadership and uh, specifically the fact that I think it's a learned skill, which I think uh, some might uh, consider a little controversial, but hopefully I can convince you of that today. Um, and then talk a little bit about the specific leadership uh, project that I had completed as part of the program. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, without further ado, uh, the, the Dr. John Fagan Leadership Program is a massive part of the Duke Fellowship. It's something that all of the sports fellows participate in. And I was hoping Dr. Uh, Taylor could chat a little bit more about it. Sure, Steve. And, and, and I think it's important before we dive too deep in here to, to define what we're talking about when we're talking about healthcare leadership. Uh, for the purposes of what we do in terms of teaching skills for leadership, we define healthcare leadership as the ability to influence others for the benefit of patients and patient populations. So I'll say that again. Healthcare leadership is the ability to influence others for the benefit of patients and patient populations. And if you think about that, everybody has a leadership role in that case, from, from the people that clean your ORs to the CEO of the hospital. And if we can make those individuals develop better leadership skills, then we're going to have better healthcare in, in general at all levels. And, and that's uh, been a passion of, of mine since I came back to Duke here in uh, about 2006 and, and uh, felt that we could really do something special with our fellowship education by introducing uh, leadership education as an essential part of that. And along the way, we decided that we wanted to honor John Fagan, uh, who was one of my mentors. Uh, and in 2008, we created a leadership program in his honor, uh, initially designed for uh, the leadership development uh, and education of, of the sports fellows and, and uh, also orthopedic residents uh, and medical students interested in sports medicine orthopedics. And we quickly found that there was a lot of interest outside of orthopedics. So now the Fagan Leadership Program includes uh, medical students, residents, and fellows from all different specialties and all different interests. And it's a very diverse program uh, designed to uh, look at mentorship and reverse mentorship uh, amongst those participants. It's a selective program where the students and house staff apply for the, the program and, and then are selected. This year we had 32 Fagan scholars, uh, 16 medical students and 16 house staff. Uh, they were divided into uh, teams of six or seven. And each team is uh, coached by an executive coach, non-physician executive coach, who also acts as a personal coach uh, for the scholars. Those teams are, are given team projects, and those team projects are a, a tremendous experience. And, and Steve's going to talk a little bit more about those team projects and specifically his, his team project. We also have five didactic sessions, uh, and uh, this year we had a trip to Annapolis uh, and uh, also uh, uh, had some time at the United States Naval Academy while we were there. Uh, again, to enhance the experiential learning that goes as part of this program. The capstone event is the Fagan Leadership Program. And uh, you see uh, Mike Krzyzewski there. Coach K has been a speaker at the, the uh, uh, 
capstone event, the Fagan Leadership Forum every year. Uh, and that uh, forum is also uh, where the scholars present their team projects. And th that uh, was just completed uh, two weeks ago. And uh, Steve and his team did a great job presenting uh, their team project, which you're gonna hear about. You see on this, this uh, screen, uh, the Duke Healthcare Leadership Model. And uh, this is an educational framework that we use. And uh, this framework actually came from uh, one of the team projects from the Fagan Scholars. So those team projects are uh, robust uh, and challenging. Um, and with this model, we've been able to incorporate uh, those lessons learned to help teach skills uh, that help everyone in healthcare uh, become more effective leaders. Uh, it starts with patient-centeredness. Uh, that's the core principle. Uh, this model based on research identified patient-centeredness as, as the most important item uh, for an effective ethical leader in healthcare. And um, uh, as a result, that's in the center of the model. And, and you're gonna hear a, a patient-centered approach when, when Grant and Brian talk about uh, uh, Grant's case uh, coming up in a bit. So patient-centeredness is, is essential and necessary, but not sufficient for effective leadership. And if you think about it, um, we all know of examples of bad behavior uh, by surgeons uh, that were justified because they were doing it for the patient. Um, but sometimes uh, those behaviors will break down uh, the team and, and break down the cohesion of uh, the other members uh, that are participating in the healthcare team. So we also identified five competencies as, as uh, necessary for effective leadership. And those include the foundational competencies of integrity and service, uh, the framework competencies of critical thinking and teamwork, and then the capstone, what we think is the most important uh, competency is emotional intelligence. And if we break that down further, emotional intelligence is comprised of self-awareness and self-management, and social awareness and relationship management. And that, that social awareness or empathy is a key part of that. Uh, and, and that emotional intelligence is, is something that uh, we can develop over time. Uh, some of us, uh, not me, but others, uh, have uh, high EQ or, or high levels of emotional intelligence to begin with. And those people are some of the most effective leaders out there. Uh, and if we can build up our emotional intelligence, we can really develop our leadership skills. So that's just a, a little bit of uh, uh, background on, on what we're doing in terms of uh, leadership uh, and leadership education uh, for our fellows at, at Duke uh, and, and on the Fagan Leadership Program. And without further ado, I'm gonna turn it back to Steve and Steve's gonna talk a little bit about his experience. Was it a good experience, Steve? Yeah, it was a great experience. Uh, next slide, please. So first, uh, first day you show up to the Fagan Leadership Program, um, this is what you do. You take the DISC assessment. Um, so I've taken a lot of personality assessments. And to be honest, I had some trepidation upon taking another one. Um, but to quote my wife, uh, this assessment knew me better than uh, she did. Um, and what it is, uh, by the way, I'm not um, paid or I don't get anything from DISC at all. It is uh, a paid uh, personality assessment, but it's readily available online and I'd highly recommend that you take it. It's a battery of uh, questions that in essence just asks how you would handle certain situations. And then it puts you in the spectrum um, largely into one of these four different categories. Um, and it will reveal a lot about yourself and it's going to help you interact with every single person, whether it be a circulating nurse, a scrub tech, um, other docs. Um, it's, it's really, in my opinion, critical to knowing who you are. So not to go into each one, but just a brief overview, uh, overview of DISC. Uh, D is for dominance. This is kind of the um, what we classically think of as a surgeon, you know, I'm going to get from point A to B, I'm going to go fast, I'm going to do it effectively and don't don't stand in the way. Um, influence is kind of the, the person who uh, doesn't see the trees overly for the forest, but has always got the eye on the end prize um, and, and is not necessarily um, overly concerned about each individual step. Uh, conscientious is kind of the exact opposite of that. And what you may see in a, a total joints colleague is really a focus and emphasis on every individual step. 
um, and perfection. And then steadiness are the supporters of all of these other groups. Um, what I like to think of as, as most likely probably the significant others of a lot of surgeons um, to have the patience uh, for the people that we are. Um, so it, it's kind of a controversial spectrum, but um, Dr. Cole, Dr. Garcia, Dr. Taylor, um, where do you all fall? Or where do you think that you fall on this uh, spectrum? Where do you think, Brian? You know, it's interesting. Um, when I've done these leadership assessments before, and there's the, um, well, I think I want to be in the, I want to be like this. And then there's who you really are. And um, there's often a big discrepancy there. Um, so if you say, so you have to say, where do you think you fall? That, that's what you asked of me. Um, and I've seen these before. And then there's when you test out, you may be different, but I guess I would say, what would I like to be? Um, I'm either influence. I wish I was dominance, but I tend to be, uh, I think more influenced to be quite frank, but if I was reassessed by someone else, I could be any of the others. <laughs> I think what there's features in all of those. And I think it's very hard to fall into these buckets, but I, I, I love the exercise. I think, I think as a fellow, you try to be more of the conscientiousness, especially with working with attendings. I think going into practice, and we'll talk about cartilage and some of the complexities, I think that I've tried to be a little more influence and a little more dominance just to be more confident in the direction we're going. Um, but if I got assessed, I'm not sure exactly where it would fall, but I think that's my goal uh, is to lead those. But I think we'll talk about that in a little bit later in terms of how the, the evolution from fellow to young attending. So, Yeah, I think both of you guys are, 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 are uh, capturing kind of the essence of this. Uh, you know, we all have our preferred way of interacting and, and, and what we're most comfortable with. Uh, but we want to be some of the other things. And, and it doesn't mean that you're the, the uh, style you're most comfortable with doesn't mean that you can't do the other ones. In fact, I'm, I'm a, a solid C. I, I'm almost a perfectionist sometimes. Um, and, and, uh, and, and I have to fight that uh, because that's not uh, what I want to be. I want to be more balanced and, and more uh, enthusiastic and, and uh definitely uh, and want to pull together the team. And sometimes uh, that perfectionist tendency uh, is, goes against that. And, and so- Dean, Dean and are it, some of those things indigenous to, the, to the, your military experience? I, you know, that's a good question, Brian. I, 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 don't, I don't think so. Um, I, I think it's, it's just part of your personality. Um, and, and, and when I look at people, um, you know, I, I can see- uh, it, those traits and others, and, and th this uh, self awareness and, and awareness of others really helps in your communication styles, and, and, and we use this as a way to help communicate. Steve is definitely an I. He's a DI, but he's got the I because he is like uh, one of the most outgoing people. So you're an easy call, Steve. Would you, would you might go to the next slide? So. Uh... Uh, the big reveal. Oh, sorry. I thought we were going to go into my uh, mine uh, there, but so this is just an open question to the audience here, and I think it's really important to consider where where you fall on that spectrum, um, and and take the disc assessment. It, it really will help you. Um, it's it just asks you uh, a battery of questions, and I think uh, all of the guys in the call nailed it. I think it really. Uh, it pegs you for who you are, and it, it may not be what you want to be, but I, it certainly will tell you uh, very close to who you are. Um, so I think yeah, we can so, go. So, so hopefully we're getting getting some results there, so you'll be able to compare uh, all of your your personality preferences here. So, Steve, let's go to the next one and, and see what you were. Yeah, so I was I was almost exactly halfway between an I and a D. Uh, closer to the eye. Um, but I think the most important part of this is one, it's going to, these types of assessments will tell you, I mean, they will do a good job of telling you what your strengths, but more importantly, what your weaknesses are. Um, in reality, uh, something I probably didn't want to hear was that the, I, I was an eye and in essence, a yes man, um, quick to say yes with a smile and think about the repercussions of how much work something is going to entail later. 
And I think till I die, I'll be that type of person. Um, but it makes you think twice and it makes you realize that it's okay to prioritize um, certain things in your life. Because ultimately as a surgeon, I think that's really important and that's uh, decisions that we have to make. Um, so uh, just a little uh, plug there, consider taking one of these types of assessments. Uh, next slide, please. So um, in starting uh, an actual leadership uh, project, this is how uh, the actual process entails. So let's go to that first bubble. So Dr. Taylor tells us, you're going to work with the Augustus White Foundation. And in response, uh, next bubble, please, I say doing what and really what's the Augustus White Foundation. And of course, uh, Dr. Taylor replies very diplomatically, uh, think big. So next slide, please. Uh, so that's what we did. We, we did think big. And... Uh, to fill in a couple of those questions or answers, the Augustus White Foundation is a uh, mental, or sorry, a healthcare disparities foundation started by Dr. Gus White in Boston um, to address uh, healthcare disparities in that greater community. Um, next slide, please. Uh, so what we did was, um, in seeing the previous info about how big of a, a deal COVID made on mental health. Um, we had to attack this issue at the roots and how do we improve mental health in Boston? So uh, to borrow one from the Fagan uh, program, we made our own healthcare equity model. Um, and these were really the key kind of um, ideals that we considered essential in addressing any issue. So healthcare leadership was a big one. These are the you know, CEOs, docs, people on the front lines that really work in the healthcare system, uh, community activism uh, in terms of, you know, priests or community leaders who are out there, you know, on the front lines, things like that. Um, knowledge, epidemiologists, you know, researchers, the types of people that get us the specific information about issues. Then to diversity, just understanding that there's a lot of different stakeholders and a lot of different uh, sub-communities within a population. And we knew that we had to get these groups together to collaborate in order to make any measurable difference. So next slide. Um, and that's, that's exactly what we did. Um, so this was kind of an aha moment one morning um, in, in figuring out how do, we, how do we lead? How do we combine leadership and healthcare equity? Um, and it was kind of a, a sore spot for me that there are so many resources, there's so much out there. And I, I, to be honest with you, I just didn't know what to do. I mean, and, and as a, a surgeon, not knowing what the first step was, you know, I figured that there's got to be a lot of other people out there that, that have the same issue. So why not just get these people in the same room? from all of these different kind of core perspectives, get them in the same room, create a conversation, let them know that there's an issue and see what we can do about it. And that's exactly what we did. So, so we held our first annual uh, healthcare equity gala in, on May 6th in Boston, uh, Massachusetts. We had over a hundred guests with a combo virtual in-person events. And to be honest, it was pretty eye-opening. I heard a lot of different perspectives about how important and how big of an impact COVID had on mental health in Boston. And one of the biggest compliments I got from one of the uh, docs who attended um, from Mass Gen was that um, she said that she met people that she actively was going to collaborate with and would not have otherwise met that person if someone hadn't bothered to get them in the same room. So, um, and this is, this is Dr. Gus White on the right here. Um, one of the first and, and most prolific kind of African American uh, orthopedic surgeons. Um, we call he says fellow human. That's how he addresses uh, people. Hello, my fellow humans. And to be honest, it's one of the nicest ways I, I think I've ever heard someone just address that humanity is what connects us all, regardless of who you are. Um, so next slide, please. Um, so again, just going back to the model. This was the model we created for healthcare equity. I would you know, implore uh, any of you on the call early in practice, at least once a year, take an extra couple minutes to think, what are the, your core values? What are the values that make up your model that bring who you are as a person to the table? And it's important to reevaluate these things because they may change over time. Some may become other uh, important than others. And it's important to realize that we don't live in a vacuum. You know, we're dependent on you know, nursing, we're dependent on family members to keep us together. So just th this little bit of self-reflection, I think, goes a long way. Um, and when combining that with some type of kind of professionalism assessment, I think um, you're really setting yourself up for a very successful uh, initial couple years of, of practice. Um, so with that being said, I'd, I'd like to turn it over to uh, Drs. Garcia, Dr. Cole, um, to chat a little bit more about uh, these specific uh, clinical decisions and and their lessons learned. Excellent. Well, thank you guys very much. That was really informative. And I think I'll probably go 
tonight and do one of those assessments, see where I truly lie. Um, so we'll go to the next slide. We're gonna start off with sort of clinical practice and then we'll have some question answer uh, section. So this is a transition to case, uh, drug testing to practice in a case-based discussion. So we have a 23 year old, uh, next slide. So going to changing things up from leadership to uh, actual clinical case. Uh, so 23 year old male, uh, you can see low BMI, he's a Boeing engineer that usually involves a lot of different questions uh, and having to explain everything a little more detailed than the average uh, patient. So pretty active, pretty standard for at least the Seattle area. Uh, so he's had recurrent damage from continuing athletics. It's kind of a two year problem. Uh, he says worse over the last couple of years, he notices swelling with kneeling, pain and popping with any squatting. Um, again, not uh, more of a recurrent injury, no previous surgeries. And really his whole main goal was, I wanna go back to doing these sports that I love and I just can't do them. Uh, next slide. So again, just jumping around. So my concerns of the story, you know, the two years of pain and someone who's pretty young and active is concerning the popping, but really for me and what I learned in fellowship is, you know, the swelling and locking for someone who's young is not normal. Uh, and again, you know, trying other adjuncts, different options, cortisone, hyaluronic acid, PRP, we've chatted about all those things. Um, and then, you know, usually trying physical therapy. And again, he came in having tried those things. And again, worry these symptoms. Again, if this swelling and locking happens, I do worry that sometimes that alone won't treat it, but it's something that still be aware of. And again, uh, most of the time I have my patients at least try it. Um, and you want to be, again, many times the smaller defects are more subtle and they may be completely asymptomatic. So the smaller defects tend to be less symptomatic, the larger ones more. So we start feeling these symptoms you think about as is a larger defect. Uh, next slide. Hey, Grant, Grant I, I'm curious, you know, you, you, you spent a little bit of time discussing popping. And when you ask patients, does your knee ever pop, lock or catch? I, I've often thought of those as three different complaints or three different um, um, sensations. Uh, how, how would you, how do you currently differentiate popping that is problematic from that, which just sort of occurs for, you know, negative pressure in the joint or other, which we may not even fully understand, but popping is a common complaint in patients worry that if you neglect it, that it may cause further problems downstream. So what, which, what kind of popping bothers you in this instance? The one, I, I, I totally agree with you. I mean, most, I mean, I had four patients a day that said their knee popped. And uh, so for me, the popping doesn't bother me. It's really the popping with pain um, or that combination of things. I think that the, the one that's the most concerning is the swelling. Uh, and, you know, with the locking, I tend to say, I tend to try to, you know, more of like, can, can I feel it when I, um, you know, put pressure on the patella? Um, but Again, for the most part, I think the swelling for me is the biggest thing that concerns me. And I, I do say if it, it hurts when it pops, that does concern me more as well. Yeah, I would agree with that fact. Yeah. All right, next slide. Uh, so again, normal standing alignment. Uh, in terms of the patellofemoral joint, he had no previous instability, no J sign. Uh, I mentioned before this patellar grind popping, no real facet pain. So right here, you're thinking this is a really vague uh, exam finding. And for trochlear defects, they tend to have these very uh, vague exam findings and really always hard to, to pinpoint the direct pain. They usually just kind of point at their knee, at least at the front of the kneecap. So we had a moderate effusion on exam, good range of motion, otherwise everything was stable uh, and no comorbidities. Uh, next slide, please. So again, first thing in the office is x-rays. So he has this very small spur medially, um, relatively good alignment. I'm not seeing a lot of subluxation of the patella. And then, you know, you can see from the, uh, PA view as well, no arthritic changes. Uh, next slide. So, you know, going on to MRI, we're gonna kind of speed through this. Uh, the defect here, and these trochlear defects can be really hard coming out of fellowship to read. I mean, I was able to see a lot of them with Dr. Cole, but you don't always get to see all those in your fellowship. And so reading these MRIs, especially the trochlear ones are more challenging. Um, this one measured roughly about two centimeters. The biggest thing for me is no bone edema. Uh, TTTG, so a little bit off at 13, but nothing majorly abnormal, and CD ratio is roughly one. Um, again, I always, this is something I learned definitely from fellowship, is these defects, while two by two is already pretty large, uh, they're usually bigger when you end up doing something arthroscopically and evaluating it. And don't write off trochlear defects in general, because it's always hard to fully identify them on MRI. Um, next slide. 
So this is just something uh, from Dr. Cole, and it's really important. And we're not going to hammer it too much because it doesn't really concern this case. But for the new fellows coming out, you know, I'm going to show you a relatively straightforward case, but that's not the commonality, especially when you're starting practice. Uh, so you want to make sure you evaluate alignment, uh, you know, larger defects. There's some um, smaller options you have for the large, I'm sorry, for larger defects, you have, you know, the Macy and uh, Carla's transplant, other resurfacing procedures. And for the smaller ones, you have the other options listed here. But again, it's sort of this Venn diagram. You got to think about instability from the patella standpoint or instability from ACL or collateral ligaments. You got to think about alignment. Do you need to do a realignment with a TTO? Or for the cartilage for condyle defects, you need to do DFO, HTO. And then if there's articular defects, you need to do a meniscus replacement. So you can't skimp on one of those things or else the whole, the whole issue with the patient's knee will not be fully corrected. Uh, next slide. So again, the biggest thing people ask me about uh, with Macy is the two surgeries. So from uh, the cold training, you know, it's not everybody's getting a scope that I see in the office with a cartilage concern. But if I think that at least the scope initially will have some benefit, I do discuss that with them. Um, and again, removing the edges and one, there was actually a paper from Dr. Cole demonstrating uh, that that alone can be uh, significant enough to cause uh, improvement and you don't need to do anything further. So if I believe that that at least alone will help, I will do that initially. So that's one of my always discussion points, even if I'm not always indicating them for Macy. Um, if I don't get enough good index information from the exam itself or from the MRI, and I think it needs to pursue further and evaluate this, then we'll consider the scope. And then obviously, if I think they need Macy, then we go with the initial biopsy uh, and the harvest. And again, I think it's important for this to, after the surgery, also help set expectations. Generally, these patients are different than your standard ACL patient, your standard you know, acute injury patient. These are complicated patients, sometimes coming in with multiple surgeries, and you got to be a little bit more patient with them. Um, again, old MRIs are not, not always ideal or older scopes, so it's something to be aware of. You don't want to have that bail on surgery, again, with nice thing with Macy's, you get multiple sheets, but if you do other cartilage defects, you can't just go in there and switch to a patella if you only have a trochlear transplant. Um, and again, the lack of primary scope, I think, you know, there's no real data on this. I'm, there might be something from Dr. Cole that I'm not aware of, but there's, I'd say most of the patients you're fine with, but there's occasionally those ones you have that bail on and you don't want to have that. So it's always good if they indicate those top three things I mentioned uh, that you have that initial scope to evaluate them and be prepared for the surgeries. Uh, next slide. Yeah, I would just, I would just, I would just make a couple of comments. Um, we first became really interested in how effective our debridements were when we were scoping some with with the intent to biopsy and then the intent to implant, and we found about forty five percent of these individuals actually never went on to, into implantation. And um, obviously, you need to have a scope to get a biopsy, uh, but. Uh, that being said, it'd be nice if we could sort of predict who's going to make an early decision, who's going to make a late decision. And we, uh, Adam Yankee and I have been working on some really interesting work, um, it's, uh, it's something called a surge score, which is a cartilage early return for transplant score. And one of the things that we um, sort of added up is that when we took uh, 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 a scale that in, in, it entertained the defect location, their level of who's pain, whether it was less than 40 or greater than 40, the VR12 physical score and their Amadeus score, we added that all up. We're actually getting to the point now where we can sort of predict which patient absent of sort of my influence or your influence will make an early decision, say less than six months to go on to uh, implant. So I think it's a little bit of a different narrative here because we do need to go in and biopsy. Uh, but that being said, it becomes interesting if a patient gets referred to you having already been biopsy and you're trying to make a decision on what to do um, and did they scope, did they debride and so forth. So a short-term solution sometimes for some patients is actually not a bad thing and they can respond very favorably. But I think we're getting our arms around now who won't respond favorably and who might actually come back by their own decision uh, for early transplantation. So it's something that's kind of fun to look at, tell patients um, sort of prognosticate based on what they might or could expect after a simple scope. Yeah, I, I, that's excellent. That's good data to have. I'm looking forward to seeing that when you come out with it, because I think that's important. I think that not everybody in fellowship gets an opportunity to this, this first priority or this first scope is really important in discussing this and deciding who's the right person for it is really important. It's, it's one of the more challenging things in some cases, because you don't have any information half the time, or you just have an MRI. And so discerning the right thing. And again, or also if someone's had a scope already uh, and had a biopsy, is that the right thing for them? Uh, next slide, please. So again, I won't go over this too much, but taking the biopsy, I usually use intercondylar notches uh, and then people do lateral trochlear ridge sometimes, try not to use loose bodies. Again, they're not as good and not as viable. Um, 
Again, 200 micrograms or two Tic Tacs worth. I use an angle curata, usually go upwards. Um, and again, it usually, I usually take a little bit more. Again, I'm, I usually end up getting up for at least two uh, Macy's. So sometimes patients cancel last minute and it's nice to have that extra. I don't always indicate people to be taking more cartilage than they need, um, but two to three Tic Tacs can usually get you at least two uh, rounds if needed. Um, uh, next slide, please. So this is the arthroscopy and Macy biopsy. We knew he was gonna have a pretty large defect. Initially just going in here, uh, just seeing that right there and then seeing the patella uh, and then next slide. So, and the importance of doing a thorough debridement, you know, this is something I definitely learned from uh, working with Dr. Cole. We did lots of these in terms of uh, having patients with a lot of cartilage defects that we went in and did these biopsies on and have different sort of procedures. And you can see here, just from a thorough debridement, I'm not using a curette or anything, just using a small shaver, I'm able to get a much larger rim on there. And this defect ended up being pretty large. Um, uh, next slide, please. So, you know, we're not really looking at the meniscus and the other things, but meniscus intact, trochlear defect measured around 2.5 by two centimeters. Uh, the good thing for here is I always double check the patella, probe the entire patella because you have a kissing lesion that changes things. Um, and you really want to thoroughly evaluate this uh, and no other involvement in any other cartilage. Uh, next slide. So surgical plan for me with seeing a defect like this without bone edema, uh, I think this warrants a Macy. Uh, there's been really good results. These trochlear patients for me tend to do quite well and you don't burn any bridges um, if anything further is needed. Um, biggest thing to think about is reducing the bleeding at the preparation site and be prepared to put sutures in if needed. But again, with the technique uh, that we have now, you really don't need to do that in majority of cases. Um, Size-wise is important too. You know, important to be prepared if it's greater than 10 centimeters squared or it's two sites greater than, or uh, greater than 14 or greater two sites greater than 10. Uh, you want to make sure that you have uh, an extra sheet of mason. You can order that pretty easily. And again, in this case, no common procedures, but it's important to be prepared for those if you do have them. Next slide. Uh, so the post-arthroscopy discussion, usually I call the patients the next day. Uh, they usually have no, they're, it's not a good idea to talk to them that day of what they need to have done next. They're not going to remember that. And plus I can document it in the note for them and helps for both the patients and for me, as well as for insurance for purposes. Um, it's important to have templates too. Again, I use templates to help with that. I learned that from Dr. Cole. It really helps with insurance authorizations and helps make sure you ask the appropriate questions or at least are understanding all the appropriate questions that are needed in order to go to the next step if needed for the patient. And it's important also to, our man, uh, to mention to the patients that they have five years to decide if they wanna do this. So it's really a low stress. And the other thing that's also nice is patients move. And so this biopsy can be transferred to other surgeons. I've done Macy's from other people's uh, biopsies and vice versa. Uh, next slide. So preparation, again, this is an easier one, but many times they're not, and you want to have a plan. And so this is just an example I learned from working with Dr. Cole. We'd always have these preparations done ahead of time, and this has saved me so many times being prepared in the OR. Uh, and I still do this uh, to this day. I mean, just have, I have one, next, one tomorrow that I'll be doing the same sort of layout I've got in there. And he used to post these up on the wall, so we'd be prepared and ready to go. So, you know, here's an example of I've got a Macy MPFL TTO. Here's my order and how I work it. And so the, the fellow is going in now. It's always important to have a little, a little short game plan. And when you post it on the wall, all the surgical techs, your PAs or your residents or fellows that are in there know what's going on. And it makes the case go much smoother. Um, uh, next slide. And then again, in the OR, this is the new set. I, I really, really like this set. It makes it a lot faster, a lot easier uh, than doing the old cutout um, with the tinfoil. Um, so Z retractors, episoc patties. I'm a big fan of transoxemic acid. I give it to pretty much every one of my Macy patients, less contraindicated. Uh, and then to seal, you want to have that ready. And then I usually use 6 micro sutures if I need to sew something in. I don't always open them, but I have them in the room. Uh, next slide. So this is the end up going on to Macy. Um, this is the debridement uh, of the defect. And then we use the pre-cutting guide and then we're able to place the Macy on there. Um, you can see here, we didn't have to use any sutures for him. Uh, and I'll show you my technique, but I, again, I run the knee through range of motion after I finish. If there's any concern, then I'll put a suture in. Uh, but in a lot of cases, I don't need to. I tend to do a few more sutures in a patella than I would in a trochlear, uh, just because the defects, the way the borders are of the trochlea, especially the thickness of the cartilage, I'm able to get a little better hold and I'm a little bit less concerned about it coming off, but that's just the way my practice and the way I feel about it. Um, I don't know if Dr. Cole has anything different uh, that he does. No, I think that's good. I think the thing that's made it much better now is having this 
um, these customized cutting guides has made all of this much more reproducible and uh, the operation has become incredibly easy and obviously the absence of sutures. So um, it's, 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 I, I just like an operation that's reproducible that gets rid of that variability. And this has become just that. Great. Uh, next slide, please. So OR tips, newer soak patties, you don't have to seal the fiber and glue. Um, I always start, I start with tourniquet on and then I take the tourniquet down to take care of any bleeders. Um, make sure it's completely dry before starting. Uh, you'll, I'll show you in the video that we do. And any concerns, you have six ovicral sutures. Uh, and then I run the knee through range of motion because I don't want to leave until I'm sure that defect uh, is going to stay filled throughout the range of motion process because they usually start CPM pretty promptly. Uh, next slide. So this is a very brief video. Uh, so you can see a pre-cutting template. This oval template is usually one of my more commonly used ones. This is a trochlear, not this exact patient. Um, and then they've got these nice curettes, uh, making sure you get a good thorough border. Again, you know, you don't want bleeding of the defect. You want to just go to the calcified cartilage layer. Um, and making sure you, I have a little, like this little hand curette I really like, cause it really gets around those edges. Uh, and then you can see making sure your assistant doesn't actually smash the Macy. So that's always important. Um, with the smaller ones, it's a little bit easier. You can see the left, uh, bottom left-hand corner is where the Macy's facing. So rough side up. Uh, and then I use a little, uh, top of a, uh, specimen cup, put a little bit of the fluid from the Macy, making sure I keep that orientation of rough side up. Um, and then neurosoak patties, the tourniquet at this point is down. So we know we're not gonna develop a hematoma. So in this patient, there was a little bit of bleeding at one of the little small areas. So I put a little to seal or fiber and glue, and then I apply significant pressure. And that usually stops the bleeding. At this point, after this step, I usually haven't had any issues with bleeding. Um, and there are other little tips you can use. And then I put another round of fiber and glue. And then what I'm gonna do is place the rough side down or the shiny side up. And these are the toothless pickups that you use. And then you place that in the defect, just being careful just to really stay on the edges and not damage it. Light finger pressure. I usually do around one minute of finger pressure check to make sure I haven't moved the defect and go to three minutes and then play another round of fiber and glue. And you can see here, I put it through significant range of motion. It didn't move at all. So I don't need any stitches. All right, next slide. So brace for six weeks, CPM. I usually set that pretty aggressively. I try to get them range of motion as fast as possible without damaging the defect. Obviously if there's a TTO or something else, we go a little bit slower. Uh, really weight bearing is tolerated with straight leg raise are in uh, locked in extension on um, when they're weight bearing weight range of motion. Again, goal is zero to 90 first two weeks. Stairs are avoided for the first six months. No real squats for 12 weeks. Uh, and this, most of this stuff is from the Macy website and also helping with uh, working with Dr. Cole and sort of the things he did. Um, and then post-op status. So he returned in nine months to all sports. He's, it was incredibly happy. Um, and uh, he went back to basketball, et cetera, no full range of motion, no further swelling. So he was happy with his result. All right, uh, next slide. Oh, Grant, sorry. can you tell me a little bit about how you chose or when you choose to do a TTO, if you have a uh, isolated trochlear defect or if you have a patella defect, what do you use as your decision-making mode? Um, I usually use around 15, but it also kind of depends on the patient. I mean, I, I see less patients with a large, TTTG that have isolated trochlear defects. It may just be my practice. With patella, I'm a little bit more, and I mean, maybe sometimes occasionally if it's a 16 or 17, I may still leave it if it's just an isolated trochlear defect. With the patella, I'm much more aggressive on TTOs. And that's just, uh, I think from, I mean, working with you, but in general, also just sort of my learnings over the last few years in practice too, I just have a low threshold to offset that defect because I find that patellas are a little more challenging with their outcomes. And so I want to give it every possible shot uh, to do well. Uh, so usually 15. Uh, and then depends on the, if it's more of an anteriorization, I'm not, there's no instability. I'll focus more on the anteriorization. If it's more of an instability, I'll do a combined anterior and medialization. Yeah, I think that um, patella, especially infralateral, even a setting of a nearly normal or normal TTTG is still offers some consideration to unload just because these are often really load related defects. So it's, it's not different than you know, correcting varus or valgus. Um, uh, but you, then you have to question if you have medial proximal defects, do they really ever get unloaded in any meaningful way? And I could argue those are the ones that you might say, look, uh, maybe we'll let those go. But even in the setting of a normal, nearly normal, we've learned that a uh, pretty low th threshold to do a TTTG or even with, excuse me, a, a TTO. Trochlea, we're doing maybe less and less just because the amount of unloading is so minimal. Yeah. And I would agree that there are certain things I've had, you know, people that were 14 or 13 with an isolated lateral defect 
or a low lavi effect and you just you just you just feel much better having moving that over because you know we still know that 13 or 14 is still not normal uh for you know for some patients so i 100 percent agree with that next slide i think we're done pretty much yeah so just this is just really quickly for any of the fellows because i actually making this presentation this is the only part i had I had not seen before this little slide, but it's kind of interesting. So at zero to three months, you know, you're, you can see where the implant's at. So when you're telling people to do certain physical therapy regimens, it's important to know that, you know, even at three to six months, this is not fully grown back. And so it's something to understand that, you know, you're not fully remodeled till that six to nine. And so it's important to understand that they're still gaining, they're still gaining the strength and gaining those things. And when you're seeing these patients at the interval uh, follow-ups that, you know, it, it, they're not going to be immediately better in the first few weeks, it takes a while for the Macy to grow back and it's very effective, but you just have to be patient and understand why you can't do those heavy squatting until six months. Um, next slide. Yeah. And, and I think, and I think it's always important to return to sport is very, it has a lot of variables. Um, it's not just biology. It's not just how they feel. Uh, return to sport is also becomes a very personal decision. It could be anything from a roster change to a contract, to a scholarship, to, Hey, I don't even like my sport anymore. I'm afraid to get re-injured. So the data on return to sport is, is pretty heterogeneous uh, for, 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 for a lot several reasons. But I think from our perspective, we just want to respect the biology enough that we don't torture what we just spent the time and energy to do. And the patients actually, uh, you know, uh, observed over that post-operative course. Yeah, I completely agree with that. I mean, the number of studies that we've done together with a lot of your patients on return to sport for many of these cartilage things, you know, and the range of return to sport is totally different and why they return to sport or if they didn't has may not have nothing to do with the surgery alone. So I think we all exactly. try to say you're going to return to sport in nine months, but, you know, I've had patients that have taken 18 months because they just didn't really want to do anything or COVID shut down. And, you know, that doesn't mean that 18 months is how long it actually takes. It's just that each patient's different. Agree. Okay. I had a couple of questions um, that, yeah, uh, you know, just right. to ask you, if you don't mind, I mean, you're, how many years out are you after your fellowship now? How far? Uh, this now? will be um, three and a half. Yes. Yeah, so, so, you know, I, I'm just curious, you know, if you reflect back to your fellowship um, and what you learned, what do you think, um, what experiences do you believe have been, you know, this is good for those, if there's some residents on this as well, when they're contemplating doing a fellowship, you know, what do you think have been most applicable to your, to you now as you're, as you practice independently? I think the most important thing for, if you're a resident is to understand what do you kind of surgeon do you want to be when you get out? You know, do you want to be doing cartilage? Do you want to do some complex cases? That's the most important thing. And then you decide your fellowship based off that. Um, but if you're in fellowship right now or examples of experiences, I think for me, it was really managing these complicated patients in your practice and your practice and helping take care of your practice as a fellow that really helped push me to the next level and made me feel much more confident going into practice, you know, doing uh, and doing them efficiently too. Like I said before, you know, I, before fellowship, you'd maybe done uh, some small cartilage, cartilage transplants and everything else, but I'd never seen, you know, TTO, MPFL, Macy done in an effective manner. And so for that, that's really important to me that that's even possible to do in one time sitting and two, that it can be done well. And then three, that patients actually do well, because that's a lot of surgery. And so that's yeah. for me is important thing. But, and then on the non-surgical standpoint, I mean, when to inject, when to do physical therapy, and then when to proceed with the cartilage surgery, when are you, when have you done enough for the patient non-operatively? That's like, listen, it's time that we start doing something uh, that's going to, that's going to make a change in your actual cartilage. And then I think the other thing of the comorbidities, understanding the staging, you, know, you have so many patients that come into your office that want cartilage procedures and a lot of them don't need it, but they're just been told by friends and family or other surgeons. And you're like, well, this is not the right thing. So when is it not the right thing to do as well? You know, when, I'm curious now that you've been out almost four years, when you have a tough case, uh, would you, what do you, how do you manage it in terms of, you know, running it by other people and maybe getting some other thoughts on, on clinical management? I mean, yes. Yeah, so, you know, there's even being three and a half, four years in and taking on some hard cases, there are still cases, you know, and a couple even last week that I'm like, I don't know exactly the right thing to do for this, or at least I'm going to get some more opinions. So, I mean, working with guys like you or other previous people that I've been at uh, Rush or HSS that I worked with, um, also co-fellows uh, that I worked with, and then people around the city and the area that do do somewhat similar cases, try to bounce those ideas off uh, them and understand. But, you know, even at three and a half, uh, years in and having seen a lot of different things and taking on a lot of cases in practice, there's still things that we continue to find that are different and 
unusual. And it's really important to be humble, uh, I guess, more conscientious for the leadership side of things and understand that you need to still ask for help or at least get information and make sure you make the right thing. Because in the end, for me, the most important thing is that I do the right procedure for the patient it has nothing to do with my ego. That's got to go away. Sure. So, you know, now that you've been out, um, where, where in your practice does Mace, Macy fit in routinely? What kind of cartilage problems? Um, so I think in my practice, you know, the number one thing is patellofemoral. You know, going in, I always heard about sorry, patellofemoral is the most challenging one to take on. I've ended up doing a lot of more of those in practice because I really wanted to find a way to get good results, but also not burn bridges. Um, so for me, the isolated patellar defects, the isolated trochlear defects without bony edema, um, and if I have something that needs a condyle and a patella you know, for me, I, I'm in private practice. So I do a lot of mine as a surgery center and we have to be cost conscientious. Um, and so, you know, that I usually do the Macy in combination, um, with those two. Um, and it's important for me also from the Macy standpoint, again, the Macy and cartilage transplant and certain things are somewhat similar results, at least from the data. Um, I may be biased, but, uh, it does help. And I can do these patients as an outpatient. I don't have to wait for a wait list. Uh, like they do for the cartilage transplants. That being said, I do do a lot of cartilage transplants as well. But I think for me, the patella, trochlea uh, is really my, the workhorse for me for Macy. And I've been really happy with the results. Um, Steve, uh, Bakshan, I have a, a question for you and your, where you are um, relative to your training. What, what can fellows do now? What advice would you have to increase their comfort with Macy as they sort of go to the next stage of their careers in practice? Yeah, it's a great question. I, I think first and foremost, just getting to the operating room and uh, watching uh, your attendings do it. I think, you know, all the points that you've brought up, um, I think it's very nuanced um, and you can do something, but I think it's important to make it reproducible and make sure you do it well every time. So, you know, not violating that subchondral bone, uh, for example, as you're uh, curating, things like that. Um, you know, for me, uh, surgery is a very hands-on sport and um, you know, watching Dr. Taylor and some others do it, I think in a very well and reproducible manner has really been um, enough to kind of uh, imbue me with confidence that I, I could do these procedures uh, initially. Yeah, great. Great. Grant, any final comments on that before we finish up? I think that, yeah, I mean, I think I, I, I'm big on videos. So I watch a lot of, you know, view meds actually the, with the first Macy in practice, I actually watched your Troclear uh, video which was kind of cool because I, you know, obviously seen it in fellowship too. And so that helped me understand that, but the website's really good. It has lots of good videos and then, you know, view Medi's amazing. So I use view Medi still uh, to understand. And if I need to do a complicated thing, you know, are there steps there that I can do? Uh, and then I'll give back as well. So I'll do my own video and post that on view Medi. but anyhow, so like the answer is, yeah, I just try to prep as much as I can prepare for the case until I feel really comfortable for it in practice. Well, I think we have a couple of more minutes just to wind down. I'm wondering if anyone, you know, on the panel, uh, Dean, uh, Steve, uh, Grant, any other topics that you might uh, think would be interesting for our audience? Well, I, I think uh, the case that you presented, Grant, was uh, really uh, an example of, of, you know, putting what the patient wanted first. And, and, you know, when we talk about leadership, at its most basic level in healthcare, you're leading that patient. Um, and uh, it's not about the person in charge. It's, it's, it's more about uh, shared decision-making and, and uh, coming to, to the right uh, decision for each patient. And, and uh, what you showed was, was an example where you, you took uh, uh, that shared, deci shared decision-making process took the available technology and, and the surgical skills that you've developed uh, and, and came up with a great uh, outcome. And, and I think that's what we're trying to do all the time. Um, so Mike, I, I have a question for, for you fellow humans, uh, Brian and Grant, if that's okay. Um, you know, not all these cases go perfect, do they? Uh, and so, uh, Maybe you guys can share some of your tips on uh, uh, what you do when and when things don't go so well. Uh, and, and, and you talked about not burning bridges, Grant, but uh, I think that that's a very important uh, yeah. process that I've learned is taking things step by step. But what other what other thoughts do you guys have? 
Well, I think that uh, it's what you don't do when things don't go well is probably equally important rather than what you do do. And if it's an, in an, you know, there's lots of ways that things don't go well. Um, I think the first issue is um, asking a patient what they would like to achieve if they seek treatment. And I always ask patients that at some point during the visit, say, look, what do you really want to get out of this if you pursue treatment? And then I would say that the part that doesn't go well is what that when, when we don't deliver. You know, patients have a very uh, specific ask. Now, sometimes it's just reassurance and they just, and they don't have much in the way of symptoms and they need permission to be more active with minimal symptoms, but they've been told they have a cartilage problem. It could be really simple or they just don't want to have a knee replacement in 15 years and are looking for your advice to say, do something to me now, despite not having symptoms. So I won't have to have a knee replacement later on. Those are things you really have to get inside the head of a patient. But once you sort of agree to agree that you're going to treat a, a patient through consensual decision-making, as you say, Dean, um, I think that's what the, the worst complication that I I don't want to have any complications, but the worst complication that's outside the operating room theater is not delivering. Um, all kinds of things can happen. You know, we can get DVTs, we can get pulmonary emboli, we can get post-op fibrosis, but not delivering, for example, a failure to uh, uh, meet their goal of, say, less pain uh, or, or more function uh, after you've dragged them through six, eight, nine, 12 months is actually really disheartening. So one of the things that I think a fellowship teaches people is that it sort of provides enough data for at least five years into the future. And when Grant interviewed with us, I said, look, you know, those of you who are seeking a sports medicine fellowship or any fellowship for that matter, this is a privilege because it can provide you enough aggregate experience if you're training with the right mentors um, and it doesn't have, you know, and you can borrow from all different mentors in terms of what you take home at the end of the day to propel you five years into the future. Because when you think about what our obligation is, what why we're put here on this earth as physicians is to really make a difference in someone's life. And um, uh, it's frustrating when it doesn't happen. It's most frustrating for the patient, but the next person in line is gonna be me or you. Uh, in the operating room, I think the most important thing is you just, you can't lose it. You know, if things are not going well, uh, it's also very stressful for the staff, your, the people around you and so forth. And you are really the sort of commander in that setting. And it's really critical to sort of keep your head together and understand that, you know, most trouble that we get in in the operating room is you can get out of trouble and cool heads uh, typically prevail. And once you do enough surgery, it'll be very rare that you'll find a situation that you haven't seen before. And that's one of the things that experience delivers. Again, more reason for a fellowship because it's, it's much better to see me struggle and get out of trouble than you get out and practice for the very first time and have to struggle and figure out what the heck do you do when you're in that situation. So those are just some things that I often think about. You know, granted, now that you've been out, you know, um, have you had any sort of uh, true, I got to change my scrubs moments uh, since you've been out <laughs> yes. and, um, have uh, really, uh, you know, you're like, my goodness, I don't know how I'm going to get out of this problem. Uh, yeah, well, I would just jump into the fellowship portion. I mean, I, I w did so many complicated cases with Dr. Cole and, you know, 99% perfect. And we have occasionally ones that, you know, we get stressed out. At, and I saw him just completely be like this. And I've, ne I've never seen a surgeon go like this in a case like meniscus, HTO combo. And there's like a little blip and he just doesn't stop. He just chill the whole time. And I was like, if I can be like that in the OR, that'd be awesome. So I'm still working towards that. Um, but, you know, definitely in practice, you know, I, one thing I'd recommend, again, if you get a good fellowship is you go after the hardest cases, you just can't be afraid. Uh, and that was really like, early on, very stressful. I mean, my first meniscus transplant or my first, you know, Macy combo with a bunch of stuff. I'm like, what am I doing here? Um, but I spent a ton of time preparing and, you know, didn't go, you know, it's not perfect in terms of the way you saw it happen in fellowship, but the result ended up being good and the patient did well. Um, but there's definitely times that I'm still learning, you know, the, you still get something, you do a case and, you know, you do a meniscus transplant or you do some other complicated thing and you're like, oh my God, I didn't even see that in fellowship. And you got to keep getting better. But that's, again, why they call it practice. You know, the biggest thing is that you don't leave the operating room until it looks good. You keep your cool during the really hard things. And I would recommend to any of the fellows coming out that you just really shouldn't be afraid to do the cases if you feel comfortable doing them. Because the more challenging cases you do, the better you will get and the less scared you will be and the less frustrated you'll be in the OR. And then you can get to that cool headed, level headed person uh, that I got to see in fellowship. So it's just but it, it's not easy and there's nothing fun about your first case when your whole surgery center's never even seen a meniscus transplant. And you're like, okay, we're going to do an HTO and a meniscus today. And they're like, what? So, you know, it's, it's early on. It's not, not the easiest thing, but it pays off the huge dividends in the end. 
Yeah, I, I, I think those are all wise words of, of advice from, from both of you. And, and granted, you know, one of the things that I tell our fellows is, you know, when, when you join that practice, uh, don't be afraid to ask for help when you need it. Uh, you know, I think there's a, a saying that to ask for help is a sign of weakness. Uh, I think that's totally uh, mistaken. Uh, to ask for help when you, when you need it is a, a sign of great uh, wisdom. And, and uh, I, have you been able to have partners that, have, that you've been able to lean on and, and uh, lend a hand when you're doing some of these complicated cases? I actually hate to say that. No, it was when I mean, I, I was the positive of that is I got very busy in Seattle, but the negative was there's only a few of us that even do that in the area. So I didn't have anybody lean on actually before I came, there was no one that did Macy meniscus transplants, HTOs, anything. And now we're doing them as outpatients. So that was a harder learning curve, but I knew that it was a bigger reward, but not having that stuff, but I was able to lean on my co-fellows and those things. And again, the nice thing is that I, if I, somebody I don't know how to do, I usually do a lab on and I prepare. It's just things I learned from uh, being with Dr. Cole and fellowship and, you know, I was able to make it for, I was also lucky to have good training uh, with Dr. Cole. So I, you know, I got to actually see a number of these things actually happen. It's not like it's the first time I've ever seen it. Uh, and I know it's possible, you know, seeing how he does it. So he's got a good team. So I just found a way I'm like, Hey, yeah. how can I take all the things I learned about and build this ultimate setup? You know, my PAs, everyone I know, knows exactly what I'm going to do ahead of time. And that's what he did. And that's been really helpful. Yeah. I, I, it's funny. Cause I had, I had a dry spell recently where I hadn't had um, medical transplants. I don't know, probably four weeks, five weeks, which for me is a dry, kind of a dry spell. <laughs> and, uh, and uh, I think because more, honestly, I think because more and more people are doing them and we're, we're growing a, a program and I've got two wonderful partners who do medical transplants and they're great at it. So, which is all, which is all good. That's part of building a program. Um, so I hadn't done one about four weeks and I look on the schedule and I'm like, oh, I've got a Mrs. Transplant, uh, Carla transplant tomorrow. And uh, I, today I had it. And uh, you remember Kyle, who's one of my physician assistants. Yeah, yeah. And you know, what he does, he, he will go in the room 10 minutes before and it could be a nurse who's never scrubbed with us before. And um, he will walk through every step and say, he points to every instrument, this is what to expect. And it just removes the, it just lowers the stress in the room exponentially. And they're, they're really fun. Once you get comfortable you know, and people sort of um, are in this rhythm. It's almost like running an orchestra. There is very little stress. And then the, the, the reason that's so important is because when you do have a problem, whether it was because of something you did inadvertently or because there's something about the patient's anatomy or other, you have the time and the energy left over. If you're spending a lot of energy to get through a case and then something happens, that can be a real challenge. You know, we only have so many reserves and I guess maybe as I get older, I have less and less reserves. So I'm always reserving things during the case to make sure that I have plenty of energy if something should happen and you can respond appropriately. But I will tell you that having a, a good team around you, these are not cases. I think Macy's easy, to be honest with you. I think, any, I think once people learn it, I don't think it's a challenge. I think the, the concomitant procedures, you know, require some judgment and, and skill uh, such as osteotomies. But beyond that, the Macy procedure is about as easy as it gets, quite frankly. Um, I think it's when you do other things combined, you're adding meniscal transplants, you're adding osteotomies, you're doing an ACL with it. Um, you only have so much time in the operating room. Having a team that has some experience and judgment, I think it really, that's, the, that's what makes the case go. And I think that's also in the best interest of the patient. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Yeah, it, I mean both of you guys uh, point that out, that uh, you got to have that team. And that doesn't happen overnight. So uh, for the fellows and those that are starting practice, um, understand you got to be patient to, to build that because you're not going to have Brian Cole's team uh, on day one when you show up at your new job. Steve, yeah. that's for you. <laughs> <laughs> but I think you can, I think you got to set expectations too, right? You come into right. practice and, you know, I have, I have, I rotate with PAs and residents and stuff, but I have my certain ones that do like after seeing Cole, like I have, when it's a big procedure, I have two or three people that I do it with and that's it. And I have yes. to do it that way. Um, those are not cases you dabble on. Uh, and I saw that, you know, in fellowship. Uh, but as long as you come in, if you know what's going to be the hard parts and you prepare ahead of time, I do find that makes a huge difference. And a lot of these cases have gotten a lot less stressful for me because I just badger the team. They know like, these cases, like everyone has to be on, like, you know, we're going to be focused for this one. You know, we do ACL, those things, and they're less stressed. But when we have this like combined cases that he did with Cole so often, you know, 
uh, now everyone's like, oh, we're just doing the meniscus transplant. You know, and that's what I want to hear. I don't want to hear people being like, we're doing a meniscus transplant. Oh, no. Well, it's, it, it, it's come full circle. We've uh, had a great discussion tonight and, and you know, we were talking about teamwork and, and uh, leading that team and, and uh, bringing them all together to include the patient as a member of that team. So I, I, this has been great, uh, fellow humans, uh, uh, to, to come together and talk about uh, Macy, talk about leadership. Uh, I think we've run over uh, a little bit, so apologies to to the audience for uh, uh, taking a little bit of your time tonight, but uh, hope everybody's enjoyed it. Indication for use. Macy, autologous cultured chondrocytes on porcine collagen membrane, is an autologous cellularized scaffold product that is indicated for the repair of single or multiple symptomatic full thickness cartilage defects of the adult knee with or without bone involvement. Macy is intended for autologous use and must only be administered to the patient for whom it was manufactured. The implantation of Macy is to be performed via an arthrotomy to the knee joint under sterile conditions. The amount of Macy administered is dependent upon the size, surface in centimetre squared, of the cartilage defect. The implantation membrane is trimmed by the treating surgeon to the size and shape of the defect to ensure the damaged area is completely covered and implanted cell side down. Limitations of use. Effectiveness of Macy in joints other than the knee has not been established. Safety and effectiveness of Macy in patients over the age of 55 years have not been established. Important safety information. Macy is contraindicated in patients with a known history of hypersensitivity to gentamicin, other aminoglycosides, or products of porcine or bovine origin. Macy is also contraindicated for patients with severe osteoarthritis of the knee, inflammatory arthritis, inflammatory joint disease, or uncorrected congenital blood coagulation disorders. Macy is also not indicated for use in patients who have undergone prior knee surgery in the past six months, excluding surgery to procure a biopsy or a concomitant procedure to prepare the knee for a Macy implant. Macy is contraindicated in patients who are unable to follow a physician-prescribed post-surgical rehabilitation program. The safety of Macy in patients with malignancy in the area of cartilage biopsy or implant is unknown. Expansion of present malignant or dysplastic cells during the culturing process or implantation is possible. Patients undergoing procedures associated with Macy are not routinely tested for transmissible infectious diseases. A cartilage biopsy and Macy implant may carry the risk of transmitting infectious diseases to healthcare providers handling the tissue. Universal precautions should be employed when handling the biopsy samples and the Macy product. Final sterility test results are not available at the time of shipping. In the case of positive sterility results, healthcare provider or providers will be contacted. To create a favourable environment for healing, Concomitant pathologies that include meniscal pathology, cruciate ligament instability and joint misalignment must be addressed prior to or concurrent with the implantation of Macy. Local treatment guidelines regarding the use of thromboprophylaxis and antibiotic prophylaxis around orthopaedic surgery should be followed. Use in patients with local inflammations or active infections in the bone, joint and surrounding soft tissue should be temporarily deferred until documented recovery. The Macy implant is not recommended during pregnancy. For implantations post-pregnancy, the safety of breastfeeding to infant has not been determined. Use of Macy in paediatric patients younger than 18 years of age or patients over 65 years of age has not been established. The most frequently occurring adverse reactions reported for Macy greater than 5% were arthralgia, tendonitis, back pain, joint swelling and joint effusion. Serious adverse reactions reported for Macy were arthralgia, cartilage injury, meniscus injury, treatment failure and osteoarthritis. For more information or to view full prescribing information, please go to macy.com.